Well, welcome to blog episode number three. So up until now, we haven't been daily. My, my ideal goal is to have two or three of these a week. Going forward, to talk a little bit about my journey towards working for myself and basically, well, I hate to say doing what I want, but doing what I enjoy more than machining, which if any of you have noticed in some of my other videos, I mentioned I've been a machinist for 15 years and I left my job in the last past June to try an office job and that didn't really work for me. So now I'm trying to basically capitalize on what I enjoy, which is a lot of programming and web development and server setup, and kind of go out on my own. I don't know how this journey is going to work. I'm definitely fairly dependent on my wife, as I've mentioned in the two other episodes right now for income, but we can pay our bills and we're doing all right between this and the apartments that I maintain. So with that, we wanted to show you a little bit more of what happened yesterday. So in the previous video yesterday, we mentioned that we lost our RX3000 ASUS router and that shut our network down for the time being. Unfortunately, with a network my size and without having a lot of extra equipment that we don't need, I don't have great failover redundancy. Luckily, I had a router here at the house that I was able to quickly throw in because I had been planning on replacing this router and upgrading it with some of this TP Link gear that I'm talking about. As you know, I love my uh, EA. P225 up at the Freedom House, and I also had bought one for down here so I could do the similar work with it. At the Freedom House, we have a PFSense SG1000 that we use for a router. Down here, I was just using a TP-Link RX 3000, which basically handled everything, including Wi-Fi, but I had picked up the ER605 from TP-Link because I wanted to try it out. Basically, because I, it seemed like it had the same capability and actually a little bit more capabilities than the SG-1000 that we had in Maine. Now, the SG-1100 is now the model that you would buy, and it's 200 bucks. The ER-605 is $60, so it was definitely a better price point when I looked at similar capabilities for what I wanted to do. Anyways, today I want to switch over to my desktop view, and I'm going to log into the ER-605 here and take a look. I just kind of want to show you guys around some of this a little bit more. I know in yesterday's video I showed you around, but I really hadn't had a chance to do a lot of configuration, and I spent most of the night last night doing most of the configuration. So it's not really a today video, but it does go right along with everything else. Most of today was spent playing with Docker Compose and trying to really learn more about Docker so I can get my portfolio website up and running. I also have a goal of getting our rental business with an upcoming website and another website that will provide a lot of um, hopefully a sales front for another idea that I have to bring to one of my other hobbies, which is drag racing. So with that, here is the initial login. You can definitely see we have a lot more core activity, but nothing even really over that 40% activity and nothing across all cores. So we're definitely not utilizing this anywhere near as hard as we were utilizing the SG-1000 at the Freedom House. And um, I definitely like seeing that. I don't know what the workloads are going to work like when we start deploying a VPN server and having fairly low workloads now definitely makes me hopeful that we'll be able to use some of the VPN capabilities here going forward. I have some definite use cases that I would enjoy that for. So I went ahead and I set up some VLANs in here. Now this isn't really a tutorial and if any of you guys are super interested about that and finding this video, go ahead and drop a comment. I don't mind making a tutorial, but this doesn't seem like commonplace hardware out there. And maybe that's more reason to make a tutorial about it because it's probably not documented anywhere near as well as say like PFSense is documented. And maybe 
just from that thought process, I will walk you through exactly the steps on another video. Well, maybe I'll get a little more detailed here. So you can't start here by creating a VLAN, like hitting add and creating your VLAN like you would in a PFSense box. You actually wanna start up here at LAN and you need to click add here. And when we add, when we click add, we get a window like this where we're gonna give it a name and we're gonna give it an IP address. That's kind of your IP address, your, your like router IP address here that's gonna communicate with it for that network, your subnet mask, and then your VLAN number. In my case, I'm broken out into a few different VLANs, which we basically push out into Wi-Fi for some traffic sep separation among some IoT devices, computers, and some of my VMs and my Proxmox servers here that we use for different things. Now that lets me isolate the traffic and stop a lot of like ping traffic and added traffic as we have on some of these networks, especially the IoT network, we have a lot of traffic that's on there from numerous different smart home devices. This house, especially not so much the Freedom House at the moment, um, utilizes a lot of smart equipment. We enjoy it down here and there was just some overall heavy wiring problems. So one of them was the ceiling fan in the bedroom never had the second light control wire ran. So we would have to, if we had the ceiling fan run, walk into the middle of the room to turn the lights on and off. And I know a lot of people live with that every day, but I find it rather annoying. I lived with it for a number of years in the first house that we refer to as the Montville house, which was the first house I built myself. And I built it a lot without know knowing some of the things that I know today that bother me or that I enjoyed. Anyways, enough on that side topic. We ended up using a lot of wise smart home devices. We started with Wiz and I had to run a PFSense server to get a lot of my automations working. Now, that isn't necessarily a bad idea, but we do plan on renting this house a little bit uh, during the summer when we're utilizing the Freedom House. And with that rental, I didn't want to have the risk of a server going down and say the bedroom light's not working. I didn't think that was a smart idea. So we switched to the Waze brand, which allowed me to configure inside of their app and their system the control of light bulbs from the switch, which allowed me basically to install a switch that didn't control a load circuit in the wall, wired up the two load lines together, and then control from that switch that's now basically a smart switch, the smart light bulbs in the rest of the room. So I could design a scheme where the ceiling fan turned on and the bed table lights turned on, or if I double press the button, just the bed lights. And there's many, many scenarios you can design there. Um, anyways, back to this. I didn't want all of that traffic from that type of stuff in the house on our main network and with our computers and our TV devices and my Proxmox stuff. I just, it was a lot of traffic. I also wanted to provide some separation between our Proxmox server and our VM, some um, more for just security reasons that I have in my own head. So that's kind of what I've done here with VLANs. And I set each one of these up individually here, right here starting and ending IP addresses, all of your DHCP and everything is set up right here in this window for each of these networks. Now that automatically actually creates your VLANs here. So the only thing you're really doing here is setting the ports up on this router switch portion of this unit. So it's got one LAN port, or actually you can configure up to four LAN ports and one LAN port. Uh, I'm configured as a singular LAN port and four LAN ports here. So I got some tagged traffic and untagged traffic depending on devices that are plugged in and where and kind of some of the other things that I want inside of my network. And you can, you can see even here, on one of these ports, I have some untagged traffic going to my Proxmox server, and then I have some tagged traffic coming in from my Proxmox server, and we'll get to some of that here in a moment. Um, actually here, I noticed, I haven't blown this up. I can make this a little bigger for you to actually look at here. Um, I hope that helps some of you. I know it's not a great, great improvement, but it's a little bit. So anyways, we set all of that up. Now, once this is set up, unlike PFSense, where PFSense basically 
says when you create a VLAN, no traffic is leaving that VLAN no matter what. This ER605 does the exact opposite. Basically allows that traffic to go anywhere. So you have to go into your firewall and you have to set up your access control list, which is what I basically spent most of the night doing, which this definitely, unless you sit here and take some time to analyze it, looks like a lot. Now, just like PFSense, these rules are basically um, designed in priority. So we have some allow rules that allow some traffic to go through from our Proxmox server and our VMs to the LAN so that they communicate can communicate with certain LANs. And we can do things like SSH and um, web interface control and some of the other things like that. But we also have a lot of block rules. And I necessarily didn't like the fact I had to create so many block rules here um, instead of just everything being blocked and having to allow it through sort of like you would with pfSense I had to go through and block all rules now this really tripped me up in, for a little bit because I created my block rules and then I went to create my allow rules and what happens inside of these rules and I'll show you in a second when I show you the kind of add rule here is they get appended to the bottom. Now there is a way we can fix that and append them to the top, but because my new rules were being appended to the bottom, they weren't working because they're basically in priority order, just like normal firewalls. And I couldn't really get them to the top where I wanted them. PF sense, you kind of just drag them up there and stuff. So that provided a little bit of frustration and spent a little bit of time. Well, I ended up figuring out here, if we create a rule, if we add here for a minute, that we have this ID value. Now, this ID value basically appends the rule in where it needs to be. So if I put a value of three, it would go in here and everything below it, or it would go in right here between two and three, and everything would move down a number. So we could put our allow rules at the top and our block rules at the bottom. So we block everything and then allow just the traffic we want. Now, I definitely don't think my access control rules are complete. Every single one of these VN, uh, VLANs in here can still communicate with their web interface and reconfigure this router and such. And I mean, maybe it's not the worst thing, but it's definitely not how I like to do it. I like to have like a server core and on say like a separate VLAN and so forth. And I probably need to set up that VLAN and configure the web interfaces to all be blocked across all of these and so on and so forth. So I definitely have a lot more work here, but that's kind of like how it works. And you can see that we give it a name, we have a source, we have a destination, and then we have our source network here and our destination network and a policy, and then the service type. Now the service type I did end up finding out um, isn't doing deep packet inspection or anything, which kind of makes sense with this level of device. It just works off of port numbers, but we don't configure our port numbers in here like we would say in a PFSense box. Um, we actually think it was in properties and then we go to service types and we actually have to create our port numbers in here. So you can see this Proxmox and it's grayed out because it's actually used in a rule. So I can't edit it or delete it or anything here, but this is the rule that was created to allow the Proxmox web interface. Now this tripped me up for quite a long time actually. The source port equal, equals zero. I had been putting the source port as the 8006 and the destination port is 8006. Well, I guess I, I must have missed something in traffic. I'm not entirely sure. I ended up getting this working after I started looking at the details of some of these other ports and noticing how they were configured, particularly this SSH, SSH port here where I can see all of these open ports for the source and the destination is 22. And I so I basically copied that down here and it did end up working. So at this point, this is really where I've left off configuring this uh, ER605. Other than the fact, I guess the other thing I should mention 
and I think it's in maybe admin setup, um, you know, management firmware upgrade. So this device did not come with a fully upgraded um, firmware at, from the box, which isn't surprising. It's the version one. They're now actually at a version two, which added a USB port, which I am talked about a little bit more. I'm kind of really excited about exploring some of that USB port for the next device because I definitely at the moment, and we'll see how the next couple of months are going, are thinking about putting another one of these at the Freedom House. The other cool thing is, is these actually allow you to have a management console so you can watch over all of your access points because this being a straight router, you have to put an access point next to it, which um, I'm also using a TP link. It's the EAP225, which these VLANs go in and then they go to. Um, virtual SSIDs, which go out to their own security schemes and basically control everything else. Sorry about that. I'm playing with something. But I did have to go in and reboot it. But we do have our normal like backup and restore options. And we have like these are the controller settings for that hardware controller that I mentioned. Now I think TP-Link sells it for like 50 something dollars. Um, but I did read in some of my research that I can host it on any Linux system, including a Raspberry Pi, which for 50 something dollars these days with the price of Raspberry Pis, it might be, that might be a bargain. But I'm kind of thinking my Proxmox server can host that and communicate with it. Um, as I get to setting up my management scheme, that might get a little more complicated because I might have to allow my Proxmox server access to my management scheme. And I don't necessarily know if I want to do that because that's that server is going to be communicating with the outside web with some containers that are put there for another one of my projects that I'm working on. Um, I think it's an easier place to play around with until I get fully developed and then I can push that out to a place like DigitalOcean or something. But it definitely allows me a place to do a lot more development and testing without having to work with my DigitalOcean's droplet, which I guess is just a personal preference. I don't fully know. I've been told both ways and it is what it is for me. Anyways, um, my voice is starting to calm down. It's getting a little hoarse here. We're 18 minutes into this video at this point, and I do have the some stuff like here's the VPN, and if we look at OpenVPN in particular, I don't have a server set up yet. I'm definitely looking forward to setting up a server and so that I can connect the Freedom House to this house and maybe have like a remote backup or something. I don't quite know where I have renters in here, how that's going to work. I'm not entirely sure if this will end up happening, but it is something right now that I'm quite dreaming about. Um, yeah, so this is where we're at here at the moment. Um, we do have here under NAT, we have some port triggering. As you can see, it's not set up at the moment for my project, but that definitely is more coming in my configuration routines. So, um, yeah, not fully in. I'm definitely not fully finished configuring this. I spent about two hours, maybe three hours last night doing it. I can't do most of this during the day because if the router has to reboot or anything, it'll drop the internet and that will definitely um, impact my wife working. So I have to wait until I'm doing this off hours as such. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video and have a good night. Bye.